<laughs> Brilliant. Okay, okay. Well, we'll start by introducing everyone today. So uh, for those of you that are here, today's talk is going to be moderated by myself and Tatiana. So Tatiana is a master's student from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. And I am a postdoc at the University of Liverpool. Today, we're going to have a talk from Dr. Alessia Gololobovo. And she is a research associate with the Whitwell Lab at John Hopkins School of Medicine. Alessia obtained her master's degree in engineering and physics from Bauman Moscow State Technical University in Russia and completed her PhD program in nanotechnology from the Joint Institute for High Temperatures in Moscow, Russia in 2015. She joined the Whitwell Lab in 2020 as a postdoctoral fellow and is working on novel methods to isolate and characterize EVs, which leads us to our talk today, which is orthogonal methods for characterizing EVs at the single particle level. So I will pass you over to her. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. First slide, and we can share. I hope you can see it well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about different characterization methods for extracellular reticles, and specifically, I'm going to focus on single particle level. In addition to their being a research associate at Hopkins, I also co-founded and right now managing the EV core facility, and they call it Excel, Extracellular Particles Characterization and Enrichment Lab. So basically what we do at Excel, we provide scientists opportunity to work with different instruments, which is developed specifically for extracellular reticle characterization. And so everything what I'm going to talk about is based on my experience because I run all the instruments we have on the lab myself. So, and we provide different, uh, we provide help with EV enrichment and separation. And of course, characterization including, including concentration measurement, size and measurement and phenotyping of extracellular radicals. So, I hope everyone uh, saw this paper. It's amazing paper from Edith Bozash, um, and it talks about uh, different types of extracellular vesicles. We all know that EVs are very, very diverse, and uh, what is challenging about them, they're all very, very um, uh, different in sizing, and they're all very, very different in composition. So that's why it's the first challenge in, uh, to measure their size and concentration, just because they're small. So there is like different ways to characterize extracellular radicals, and many of these characterization methods we adopted from uh, bulk analysis and different technologies which were existing uh, for other uh, Particles, not only particles, but in bulk analysis, for example, different protein assays like Western blots. It's it was here for many many years, as well as proteomics, different lipid assay, different RNA detection method, including UVVs and PCR and sequencing, and of course optical detection methods uh, in the bulk like DLS, uh, dynamic light scattering, static light scattering, and multi-algal light scattering. But recently, there are many, many new technologies appears, and many of them are specifically uh, developed for extracellular radical characterization. In general, we can divide them on optical methods like flow cytometry, nanoflow cytometry, nanoparticle tracking analysis, uh, SPRs, and super resolution microscopy, for example. I know you guys had a lecture about flow cytometry, so I'm not going to talk about this, but I'm going to use flow cytometry as one of the gold standards. I'm sorry about the background noise, it's always like this. Um, 
So I'm going to use flow cytometry methods as a comparison for other methods. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about non-optical methods, uh, which is uh, also appears um, to be more and more popular in extracellular vesicle field. Some of them are very common, like electron microscopy and atomic force microscopy, but some of them develop, developed and implemented specifically for extracellular vesicle research. And again, I will start with optical techniques because we have like many instruments which are developed for extracellular vesicle characterization based on optics. And EV is unfortunately on suburban scale. So it means they're very small and they have uh, limitations uh, to use an optical technology. So we cannot just look at the microscope and see EVs. They're very small, right? So the main challenge is diffraction limit. So, and I know guys, you had a talk about nanoparticle tracking analysis, but I decided to include it here because I have a slightly different perspective on this technique. So I will start with nanoparticle tracking analysis because it was one of the first technologies which were uh, developed and specifically fine-tuned to measure extracellular vesicles. And it started more than 12 years ago, as I remember, with one of the first instruments uh, specifically for EVs, nanocytes. So right now there is many more instruments uh, on the market. For example, ZetaView, we have a Hyperon, which is like one of the recent one, but all of them have a very similar principle. Um, they can count and size particles and they can also recently uh, can use uh, multiplex phenotype and biofluorescence. So what is important uh, in nanoparticle tracking analysis? So we don't see the particles uh, right away. So basically we shine the light on the liquid where particles located and we measure the scattered light from these particles. In addition to this, we can track particles uh, and uh, depends uh, their diffusion coefficient or how fast they move on the liquid, we can estimate the sizes here. So a few uh, important equations on the screen, and uh, you can see that uh, based on the equation, uh, the sizes of the particles may not be very accurate. Another very important challenge, uh, which some company will not talk about, the uh, NTA technology is usually based on the microscope. So what we have to detect the particles and focus on the particles and is something which is very, very similar to the regular microscope when we check like, for example, cells. But in this case, we check and focus on extracellular vesicles. And again, because of the fraction limits, it's hard to see them. And based on the Stockenstein um, equation, it's even more difficult uh, to focus on different sizes particles. For example, on the right here, you can see that um, the smaller particles can be in focus while larger particles will be out of focus. That's a main uh, difficulty when you do nanoparticle tracking analysis. So the best application for this technology is monodispersed samples or at least samples which is very, very close in size. And we know so for many extracellular vesicles, this is not the truth. So I'm gonna show you a couple images from one of the paper uh, from my colleague, uh, Dr. Tanina Rab. So what they did on their paper, they measure a uh, different population of polystyrene and silicon nanoparticles with different sizes. And they measure this based on an, uh, tracking analysis. And you can see since uh, this device basically based on the physics developed to, some, to measure something monodispersed, it's hard to see and distinguish different population of uh, two different uh, particles like polystyrene and silicon. Uh, and with AVs, it's even more challenging. For example, I have uh, three different uh, subsets of EVs with three different cell lines, uh, XP293F cell line, uh, which is artificial cell line derived from 293 cells, um, MSC cells, uh, which is umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells, and red blood cells, extracellular vesicles. You can see all three different subsets of extracellular vesicles measured by nanoflow cytometry has very different sizes. Especially it's clear for red blood cells of these, uh, which appears to be by model distribution with a smaller particle sizes around 50, 60 nanometer in 
uh, mean diameter in a larger population of the particles close to 120, 130 nanometer in size. But when we try to measure it by nanoparticle tracking analysis, it's hard to see any differences uh, between the sizes of the extracellular vesicles. And it's especially clear for red blood cell cavities uh, where we do not see the distribution uh, of the bimodal uh, population of this extracellular vesicle. And again, it's not because something wrong with the instrument, it's just basically how uh, physics works for this, this, this particular analysis. There are always tricks uh, how to use uh, non-particle tracking analysis. We, for example, can focus on a smaller population first and try to measure it first, and then try to focus our laser on the larger particle. But it requires a lot of time and it's not always possible. Uh, just based on the practical information, uh, usually depends on the instrument, you may need around five to 30 minutes uh, to just run one sample. And again, uh, this instrument is very dependent on the concentration because you physically see the scatter flight of the particles. So you cannot oversaturate your detector, otherwise you will not see any single particles based. So it's right now, most of the instruments run only one sample at a time. Uh, some instruments offer other sampler, some not. So it's very dependent on the um, manufacturer of the instrument. Uh, another technique which we often use in an Excel facility in our lab is single particle interferometric refractance imaging sensor or sensing. So there is like a few names you can find in the literature. Usually it's just uh, uh, goes with the short name uh, SPRS, but sometimes in the paper you can see Exaview, sometimes you can see R100 or R200 based on the instrument name. And right now uh, the more common name is Leprechaun. This is the new version of the same instrument, basically. What this instrument does, it counts and sizes particles, uh, uh, which are actually uh, attached to the micro array chip. Usually, uh, uh, micro array chips covered with some sort of antibodies. For example, the standard configuration of the micro array chips, which is available for purchase, is tetrastenians. Uh, both for human and mouse sample. For example, we have CD9, CD63, and CD81 uh, kits. Uh, this is, will be your standard configuration. In addition to the antibodies of interest, which we can use for capture EVs, they also provide the uh, negative control spot, which is usually IgG spots uh, on the uh, different species. For example, for human samples, we have mouse. IgG spots to basically, this will show you on specific capture of your particles, contamination from the different species, or if your antibody of interest can be captured for um, different antibodies and negative control. So this is a very important spot on the chip. So for most uh, samples, we have slightly different configuration. For example, um, in this case, we're gonna capture only but C by CD9 and CD81, and we will have two negative control spots, which is hamster IgG and rat IgG spots. In addition to uh, size and particles by interferometry, we also can do phenotyping. First of all, uh, based how it captured, in which particular spot it captured, we can identify which tetrastenians are more abundant compared to other one. And we also can label captured antibodies with uh, fluorescent antibodies. We can use up to three or four fluorescent antibodies in the ch same chip, depends which version of the instruments you have. So working principle is very, very simple. So we shine the light and there is no biomass on the chip, we have a different phase shift. And where we have particle or biomass, we have a different phase shift. So, and in addition to this, we will see a different contrast uh, based on the particle sizes. For example, on the left, you can see there is no particles. We have a background level, there is no particles appears. When we have a smaller particles, particles will have less contrast and we will have larger particles, uh, we will have higher contrast. So basically what we measured by interferometry, this is particle di diameter, and it's actually based on the optical path length, how far away your particle from the detector. 
So uh, on the bottom, you you have very, very simplified version, how basically we determine the diameter of the particles based on SPIRS technology. So it's optical pulse path length divided on refractive index of the particles. Unfortunately, for extrasolar vehicles, uh, we don't usually have a refraction index. First of all, because uh, all EVs are different, right? So we have to use something average. And the second one, usually manufacturer does not allow us to change a refractive index based on our data. And um, as far as I know, uh, the uh, refractive index, for example, we have an a replicon device, it's a refractive index of silicon nanoparticles. So this is a typical picture you're going to see on SPRS technology based on interferometry. So again, EVs are below the diffraction limit, uh, right? So that's why you see the similar sizing spots, but some of the particles appear to be brighter compared to the other ones. And the ones which appear brighter, that is usually larger particles. And the one is very close to the background is usually smaller size particles. So uh, there is a limitation uh, on this technology based on the detection limits. So usually in the instruments, we have a 50 nanometer uh, uh, low detection limit on the interferometry. Uh, right now, manufacturer actually created a high sensitivity model, which all allows you to see particles a little bit below around 30 nanometer in size. And upper diameter detection limit is 200 nanometers based on uh, interferometry again. And uh, this is a performance with mixed sample population. I highly recommend you to read this paper. It also has a little bit more information about um, not just silicon polystyrene particles, but also with biological samples and how it performs on a different instruments. So again, uh, with SPIRs, uh, we do see four different populations on both silicon and polystyrene particles. And as I mentioned before, uh, probably this instrument used silica refractive index, and you can see this instrument performed a little bit better with silica particles compared to polystyrene particles uh, based on identifying the uh, true sizes uh, of the mixed population. Um, with biological samples, uh, we can see uh, uh, similar, basically, um, pattern. For example, based on nanoflow cytometry, we measured a pop two different population, which is derived from HIV-infected cells, uh, which release not only uh, extrasolar vesicles, which here in red on top picture, um, so it, you can see uh, bimodal distribution and we also these cells also release HIV variants which is usually larger in size and you can clearly see it on nanoflow cytometry and we also see it very well on the uh, SPRS so on the bottom on the left side PM1 EVs it's the same cell line released non infected with not infected with HIV so it's releasing just extrasolar vesicles and you can see the population uh, which is shifted to the uh, left and close to 50 nanometer in size and when we have an infected cells which release both extrasolar vesicles and HIV you can clearly see by model distribution by SPRS interferometry analysis uh, in addition to the sizes measurement, uh, we can also do a phenotype with uh, SPRS. So basically, uh, after incubating your chips as extracellular vesicles, after capturing your EVs on the extracellular vesicle uh, on the uh, microarray chip, you can label uh, with different combination of the of fluorescence antibodies. And based on the number of lasers, you can have you can have up to four color colocalization on a single particle level. So basically it depends on uh, the lower limit. It's basically based uh, how many particles will be captured uh, on your negative control spot and how good is your antibody. If it's create any non-specific um, binding to the negative spot, which will basically have a background on all other spots and other uh, phenotyping detection based on how many particles and how much protein actually is present on the particle on a single particle basis. 
that these pictures actually represent uh, very well what you're going to see uh, after you do SPRs. So every single particle you see here, it's extrasolar vesicles. So it might be in different colors. Some of the colors can be color colorized or not color colorized together. But this is like a typical appearance of the SPRS images. So just a little bit practical information. So it depends how you process your samples. You may have about 20 minutes of hands-on time over two days. It's usually two days experiment because it's required you to incubate the chips overnight uh, to capture your extracellular vesicles and about 10 to 20 minutes of instrument time for sample just to scan and analyze every single fluorescent channel you have. You can run up to 9 to 16 uh, samples in, at once, which is very convenient. Um, unfortunately, it does not have autosampler right now, but it has very, very useful in, um, chip washer. So if you have chip washer, you can save your time from three hours to about 20 minutes. Uh, we um, usually implement several assay controls here to validate the result on SPRS. For example, when we do, um, I showed previously, for example, when we did uh, different subpopulation viruses and extracellular vesicles, we implemented additional control, non-infected cells, so extracellular vesicle just from non-infected cells. Also, it's very useful to just do your media control cell, which uh, for cell culture driving, which is not exposed to cells. In this case, uh, you basically, you will confirm that the antibodies are not captured to something which is from the media itself. In addition, you can check if your media actually has some sort of particles which uh, can capture to the spots of interest. Uh, which you're performing. For example, if you use FBS uh, to culture your extracellular vesicles, um, we know that CD9 spot can capture uh, bovine uh, extracellular vesicles. So basically, you need to make sure that your media does not have a bovine extracellular vesicles, otherwise your result will be skewed toward the non uh, uh, non particle particles which is not interested to you, right? So in addition, we also implement a uh, staining specific control. For example, if you want to measure something which is inside the yeast, or you don't know where is your protein of interest located outside of the EVs on the surface or inside the EVs. So we can do permeabilized versus not permeabilized states basically to identify where is your protein of interest and also uh, make sure that your particles somehow were not broken or permeabilized during the uh, enrichment or isolation process. And basically, in addition to this, we can also do staining reagent in the buffer itself. Uh, very similar to what we usually do with, for example, nanoflow cytometry to make sure that you don't have a non-specific binding to your spots. I also would like to show you a couple of good examples. Unfortunately, good examples do not look very impressive compared uh, to the bad examples. For example, um, this is a good example, like every single dot you see on the left picture is one single extracellular vesicle with different colors. So, and very important here on our uh, ex uh, negative control spot or mouse IgG, we don't have a lot of capture. It means there is no specific capture. There is very accurate results, so we can trust our data. So, and on the pictures, we also see individual dots are not blended together. It's hard to just. Uh, it's very easy to distinguish between individual particles. Uh, however, bad examples maybe look prettier because they are bright. It's easy to see, but. Uh, they're all blended together. It's not through single particle analysis anymore because it's hard to distinguish between individual particles in this case. In addition to this, you can see on uh, IDG spot, we also have a lot of capture. And uh, all three channels, fluorescent channels that uh, I have in this screen, so red, green, and blue, they're all very similar. They appear to, uh, there is like very small differences. It means that you probably saturated your chips and it's very, very hard uh, to actually find true differences between the transit sustaining distribution. So 
this is one of the bad example. Of course, it's not bad example. You always can see, for example, in this case, you can see that green channel CD81 is like much brighter compared to other one. Probably you can say that probably your samples will have more CD81 when you actually dilute your samples more uh, to do actually single particle analysis in this case. So, and this is the example that we as a scientist not always use instrument as they were intended to use. So my colleague, Dr. Zach Troyer, and I hope he's still in the audience, he developed uh, a specific technology, which we uh, call Spearfish, uh, to use um, SPRs combined with SM fish to measure um, RNA in the particles. So in this case, uh, we use HIV as a model of extracellular vesicles because we believe in our lab that viruses and block viruses are extracellular vesicles as well. So in this case, since uh, HIV is a little bit larger, it's easy to detect, and it, we for sure know that infectious variants have RNA. So this we decided to use it as a model uh, for RNA detection. This is a very busy slide, but I would recommend to read this uh, preprint. This is very interesting. Um, uh, showcase how to use the instrument uh, and how to try to basically um, challenge a little bit the instrument and use for something which is very different. So most important image um, on this picture is combined SM fish. So basically, you can see the majority of the uh, RNA detection were observed on the larger population of the particles, which in our case are HIV variants. So super resolution microscopy becoming more and more popular nowadays. Uh, so I'm not an expert, but I decided to include uh, the slide because it's super powerful technology. And it's kind of like, right now it's doing very similar thing what SPRS is doing. It measures uh, multiplex, uh, it multiplex phenotyping of extracellular vesicles. And usually it's tetraspinning right now. So, but, um, in this case, every single dot you see on the right screen, it's not an extracellular vesicles. Every single dot you see is a protein. Or I would better say it's a blinking event from the fluorescent protein. So V-Storm or SMLM, SRM, Palm, and Paint, this is all different names of super resolution microscopy technology. So there is like a few instruments available on the market and millions of instruments were developed uh, in-house because basically what you need, uh, it's very good confocal micro instrument, a uh, very good micro microscope, which for example, you can use for confocal microscopy. So what is different uh, when you use, for example, this term, use a different fluorophores and you use a different buffer, which allows your uh, fluorophores to go in and out. So basically in, uh, in a single time when you do confocal microscopy, all your fluorophores are active, right? You can see um, fluorescence from every single time. When you do, do this storm or super resolution microscopy, some of the fluorophores will be down. Uh, so they are not exposing any fluorescence and some will be up uh, and you have a lot of fluorescence. In this case, we can stretch the detection limit down to around 20 nanometers. There is a very good lectures about the resolution microscopy on Isaac Mock series. Uh, so I highly recommend you to listen to it. Or you can invite amazing uh, people who are doing super resolution microscopy on extracellular vesicles to present on this snail characterization series. And I highly recommend it because it's very, very cool technology. I just started to use it and I love it so much. So I will start. Uh, we'll continue with uh, non-optical methods. So again, I'm not a super expert in electron microscopy, but I use it a lot uh, for very specific reasons. Uh, electron microscopy it can be a very different instrument used, but they kind of have a very similar principle when we shine the electron beam towards our particles. And based uh, how you capture your particles and how you cover your particles, either negative staining or you add some sort of um, 
uh, metal on top of the extracellular vesicle, you uh, will see a different uh, results, right? So it can kind of count and sizes particles. And uh, for example, for transmission, electron microscopy, they also can do phenotyping uh, by using gold labels. What I use this instrument for mostly to check the sample quality or morphology. For example, you can see in two different samples. On the left side, you can see kind of aggregates, lot of debris, lots of particles which look very different uh, from the regular morphology of extracellular vesicles, which is usually um, like donut shape or inflated balloons shape. And on the right side, you can see like more clean samples with typical um, EV appearance. So basically you can see which isolation methods, for example, to use for your samples. Uh, definitely, if I'm going to do this experiment again, I prefer the methods on the right compared to the methods on the left because it's allowing me to isolate and purify extracellular vesicles a little bit better. In addition, uh, what we can see with uh, electron microscopy, for example, the world paper from Quadil Steroid Group, when they isolated extracellular vesicles and particles from the mouse samples, and based on cryo uh, microscopy, they found the uh, viruses on their population. So again, you can find something which you don't expect to see. So it's very easy and very visual method. So seeing is believing, right? So that's why it's important to do one of these methods. And on the right side, I thought I isolated extracellular radicals, but based on my TM microscopy, since the majority of the particles I isolated is actually lipoproteins. So I do not see any typical extracellular radical shape. Uh, they're very round particles, lots of aggregate, lots of protein aggregate, and lots of LDL, VLDL particle, which is low density lipoprotein or very low density lipoprotein. So I'll probably in this case need to improve my uh, enrichment, extracellular vesicles enrichment methods. Another very powerful technique is atomic force microscopy, and it's become more and more popular, uh, fortunately for us, um, for specifically for extracellular vesicles research. So it can count and size particles. And in addition, what it can do and can do particle stiffness. So basically mechanical properties of your particles. Um, so this is not my slide, but this is like a brief example what means the particle stiffness and what is important when you do atomic force microscopy measurements. So basically you can see the contact angle gonna change, depends how stiff is your particles. And you can derive something very, very interesting uh, out of this result. For example, this is a um, paper published in Journal of Extracellular Vesicles in 2023. And this is one of my favorite pa papers so far using this technology. So on the top graph, you can see uh, human extracellular vesicles and red blood cells of extracellular vesicles uh, measured by atomic force microscopy is based on contact angle versus equivalent diameter of the particles. Uh, and you can see it's a broad range of the particles. Uh, it's good for me because I work with red blood cells and these, you can see red blood cells and these also shifted towards the larger particles, which I see in my experiments as well. But the very cool experiment they performed was with uh, lipoproteins. So problem with lipoproteins is they are everywhere and they're very, very abundant. So especially if you try to work with extracellular vesicles from biofluids, uh, you will find different subclasses of lipoproteins here. And what this group did, they measured uh, contact angles, uh, stiffness, and diameter for all, like many subclasses of the lipoproteins. And you can clearly see they're very, very different from the extracellular vesicles, which is great. So basically using atomic force microscopy, you kind of can estimate the uh, proportion of your uh, extracellular vesicles in lipoproteins, for example. And which is more exciting for me, they, were, they even were able uh, to measure high density lipoproteins. This is a, one of the smallest subclasses of lipoproteins with average diameter seven nanometers. So 
this technology allows you to see very, very small particles here. One of the good examples of the uh, atomic force microscopy images uh, where you see like very bright dots and they're very sparse within each other. So it's easy to measure single individual particles. And this is one of the bad examples of the, it actually was the lipoprotein samples, not the EDs, but you can see that all particles cluster together. So one of the challenge with atomic force microscopy is to find the proper dilution and it may take some time to a couple of trials to do so. Uh, another non-optical technique, which is also very, very popular uh, right now in the field, is the resistive fault sensing. There is like different types of instruments. Uh, for example, a few most popular one, NCS1 or Spectra, then it's the same name. So it's also another instrument which is employed. They have a slightly different principle, but uh, very important for them, they do not use optics to measure concentration in sizes of the particle. So it's electronic sensing only. So there is differences between the configuration of the instruments, but uh, you usually have a channel and when particles passes through this channel, it generate current or basically uh, we detect the difference in resistance. So the smaller di uh, difference in resistance, the smaller particles and large current produce large particles. So the principle is very simple. Um, so basically the only thing on the channel you need, every single individual particles pass through the channel one by one. So, and it's performed pretty well with mixed sample population, again, from the same paper and from Dr. Arab. Uh, they uh, measured polystyrene and silicon nanoparticles and detected different sizes on this uh, two different subset of the samples. And this is how it performs with the same set of samples. Um, again, uh, particles XP293 F EVs, MSC EVs, and red blood cells EVs measured by nanoflow cytometry and by uh, multi uh, resistive pulse sensing. So you can see very similar profile, including bimodal distribution on red blood cells EVs. So the challenge with uh, RPS is processing. And usually it's five minutes hands-on time just to measure samples, but, and dilute your samples, but depends on your dilution factor, depends on your quality of the samples, how many additional particles you have, not just EVs and the samples, how much protein you have. It may take up to five to 60 minutes uh, of instrument time for one sample. So it's hard to predict, it depends uh, on your samples. So for example, for a Spectrodyne or MRPS device, it's only one trip at a time. And uh, I've never used Exoid, though I think it's the same. It's just one sample at a time. Uh, it can be combined with other sampler. And I know that company is trying to develop something like this right now. Unfortunately, there's very no uh, available one. And this is a true single particle uh, technology. So, and I think I'm concluded here. So I would like to thank you my lab, which helps me a lot to measure all the samples with all different technique. And I happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. Oops. Um, let's see here. Um, I think asking, let me unmute our co-hosts. <laughs> Emily. Thank you very oh, much. Okay. <laughs> you can talk now. <laughs> Perfect. Um, we had received uh, one question in the yeah. chat, so I will hand it over to you now. Oh, yeah. First of all, Alessia, thank you very much for for the excellent talk, super interesting. We already got a question pretty early on by Amsalu. Um, do we need a combination of techniques to characterize EVs? I assume more reliably. 
yeah, I showed you examples of three different uh, EVs, right? XP, MSCs, and red blood cells, right? It depends on the technology. You can I can go back to the RPS, right? So this compares to nanoflow cytometry and uh, MRPS. Uh, it's very close to each other for XP, so 93F, and MSCs, you can see, right? But it's quite different for red blood cells. EVs. The smaller population looks the same, but the larger ones look different. So based on your goal of your project, you may want to combine several techniques, right? Um, I would recommend to have a few, at least, with different classes, if you can. Um, I also very, rec very recommend you to stick with MISEF guidelines, uh, which basically ask you to do at least one or two bulk characterization methods, right? Western blood and couple single characterization methods, like counting your particles, for example, having a concentration and size. You usually can combine those two, right? And also uh, do a phenotype and a single particle method, right? Uh, it doesn't need to be specifically XFU or SPRS. You can try to do it with non-flow cytometry, which also will give you a size and concentration at the same time. Fortunately for us, people develop more and more devices which combine all this method together, right? So, and it's easier for us. We just run one sample and we can get a lot of information from it. All right, thank you. There's another question coming in by Gazal. Uh, dear Alicia, great talk. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted to ask about the differences of isolation techniques on your um, TEM samples. Have you used a combination of isolation or have you used a combination of isolation techniques and do lipoproteins affect the analysis with SPIRS? Uh, this one. So basically on the left, you can see size exclusion chromatography samples. And on the right is ultracentrifugation plus size exclusion chromatography. So yeah, uh, depends on the isolation methods. You may require a combination. Uh, of the isolation, especially if you worry about uh, contamination. For example, you want a true population or true phenotype uh, for bulk analysis like protonics, right? So it's important to do more extensive purification. But uh, for SPRs, we don't need to remove lipoproteins. Uh, we, we can even run like crude plasma on it. And we know that lipoproteins do not carry uh, as far as we know, they do not carry tetraspinin, so they're not going to capture uh, on any of the spots. So it's easier to work with SPRs just because it's a primitive technology. It's just give a protein of interest to capture your EVs. All right. Um, I, in that vein, I would actually also have a question on my end. Um, during my thesis, I was uh, working on possibilities on using colocalization in the NTA with fluorescent dyes. And uh, I wanted to hear your opinion on trying to detect less abundant uh, markers because tetraspinins are pretty abundant, obviously, in the V population. But how feasible uh, detection of any marker for, for example, biomarker discovery in disease or something like that is uh, with any of the fluorescent methods uh, that you have presented? You're muted. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm muted now. So it's possible. And I show this with um, SBRS example. Right then. Uh, so what we did here, proportion of HIV was not a lot in our cases. So basically, in majority of the cases, there is a preprint uh, version of this paper where we not only work with HIV, we also measured RNA in extracellular vesicles. And right now, we assume that one of a thousand, just a few particles actually, uh, EVs carry RNA and we detected tRNA and tRNA fragments uh, in this paper. So it's possible. It's very close to backgrounds. It's hard to distinguish, but it's definitely 
possible. And I know for biomarker discoveries, people also use super resolution as well. So where you not only check the protein of interest on the yeast, you can also see a like basically a localization of the protein of interest. Uh, depends how many events you can run on flow cytometry and uh, which instrument you use, you can also do it. Uh, usually flow cytometers are not high throughput, right? So it's hard to like measure hundreds and hundreds of samples uh, on this instrument, but it's definitely possible. Any fluorescence, if, you, if it's visible, you can basically with single particle technology, you can detect it. The question is how many particles you actually have and how long you need to run your experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have another question coming in by Trin. Um, thank you for the great talk. Can we measure EV concentration by NTA directly from conditioned medium without purification? Uh, it's a good question. So in my experience, it's not easy because proteins and protein aggregates on the media will affect your measurement. So basically your screen, depends on the instrument as well, your screen might be too blurry uh, and it will be hard to distinguish the actual real particles there. I would prefer like simple enrichment, especially for NTA measurements um, because your media and proteins in the media can screw your result a little bit. Yeah, Colin also mentions in the uh, in the chat that phenol red could be a problem, so it should be phenol red free media. Um, yeah, that depends on the, the laser measurement. you use. Depends yeah. on the laser you use. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? I do have a more um, perspective question um, that I would like to get uh, Alicia's opinion on. Uh, the first one is. Um, the, what do you see with like your experience and all the instruments that you have been exposed to for single EV characterization? What do you see as the main challenge to actually achieve um, phenotyping the rare events that we have on the surface of EVs? I'm not talking about the transplants, but more of uh, the needle in the haystack. Uh, just as basically a sensitivity and many companies are trying to work on it. So we right now, we do not see the smaller EVs. Usually we mm -hmm. eliminate it, uh, they are not visible. And if you have just one single protein on EVs, and sometimes very, very difficult to see on the detector, right? Sensitivity of, of your detector is very, very important. So how much can you stretch the detector sensitivity down to see just single event, single fluorophore? Uh, so in, there is like many, many instruments, especially in flow cytometry field, uh, which are working on this problem, just basically trying to detect single events um, with single fluorophore on it. So this is the main channel. challenge in, in the field right now. And again, like we really need uh, sorting, EV sorting based on the uh, fluorescent trigger, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See here. You know what I think we know. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think we're pretty <laughs> out of questions, it seems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Sounds thank great. you very much for the excellent talk and thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye, everyone.